You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. So we'll see if that maintains throughout the special as we welcome on our next set of special guests. Let me now go out to the quiet, the sleepy hamlet outside of Chicago known as St. Charles, where we are joined once again by Mr. Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to our election night special, sir. Or I should say welcome to it. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, this, is the, this is the only place I'm convinced in existence where there won't be some type of bias, either liberal or conservative, the only bias that we're going to have here tonight is going to be towards what the markets are doing. And uh, the, the biggest arguments that we're going to have is if we're bullish or bearish on things. And if you don't like that, then by gosh, you're not American. Then you're not American indeed. I couldn't have said it better myself. And we're also joined here on the special tonight by Mr. Eric Metz from Spider Rock Advisors. Eric, welcome to our Options Insider Election Night special, sir. Thank you. Good to be here. All right, let's start as we have done with everybody. Let's go around the horn since, Eric, we got you on here. We'll start with you, sir. Obviously, a lot's been going on. This has been a big talked about election and a big talked about volatility point since the beginning of the year. We were talking earlier on our special tonight about how this election bump has been priced in at least since January and how it has evolved throughout the year. Obviously, other volatility events have come and gone in the interim, but that election bump persisted and remained until about a couple of weeks ago. So a lot to unpack there. What's been lighting up your tape and what's been on your radar over there at Spider Rock leading into this very busy day, sir. No, you couldn't have uh, you couldn't have summarized that better, Mark. I uh, saying this year is unprecedented is an understatement. I mean, coming into the year, the the election was forecast and hyped it, and in the regard that you just highlighted. But you know, entering coronavirus and the most vicious sell off we've had in a fourteen day span, coupled with the Q two rally that was the fastest. Uh, retracement rally on record and you know you enter in you know to the political scene here in November and that election bump you know was really priced in and then it dissipated right um, you know I think the markets can sniff out information faster than any media or poll and uh, I thought you that I, I think you saw that transpire in both you know the the VIX futures curve but also in markets in general both on sector positioning and the aggregate market and the S&P itself so you know more more to come as as news you know will translate into the markets but uh you know I think the markets are you know it's been a fortuitous year for them given all things considered um you know and when what happens you know going forward uh time will tell but you know looking forward to to diving into debating that All right and same question for you Mr. Uncle Mike sir obviously Probably a busy time over there at St. Charles Wealth Management, doing a lot of put rolling, I'd imagine, for a lot of the clients. I'm sure a lot of the calls coming in are like, hey, how can I get some of those put things? So uh, what's been lighting up your tape and on your radar as we approach this volatility and trading day of days, sir? Well, uh, what I think, it, what I thought is really interesting, uh, what's lighting up my tape uh, right now, is that the one day... Uh, the options that expire tomorrow, the straddle from the beginning of the day today to the end of the day today, uh, went from 12 points on SPY, or I should say 120 points roughly, in um, 
uh, the S&P 500 down to roughly 80 to 90 points approximately at the end of the trading today. So uh, a, there's a lot more, uh, a lot of vol came out during the day today. And of course, we had a market rally. Um, and, and this is kind of like any election in that Trump thinks he's going to win. Biden thinks he's going to win. And of course, that's natural. I don't fault any of them for that. There, I can fault both of them for a lot of other things, but that's another story. Um, but I think that when we have some vol coming out, uh, like that, it, it's not surprising just because there was just so much of it. And when what's going to be like right now on the election night, it's too early to call anything. It's just one of those things to where you'll see one when you look on TV, you'll see one candidate leading 90 percent to 10 percent, but they only have like one percent of the precincts. Uh, reported. So it's still really too early to tell anything right now. It looked like uh, last I looked that Trump was looked like he's somewhat in the lead in Florida because uh, I think they had uh, roughly 90 percent reporting. But as we go on tonight, uh, it's going to be interesting to watch the S&P futures. Uh, I remember we were limit down on the S&P futures uh, back in 2016 when this happened. And so just so our audience knows, limit down means it's not going to the the futures markets will, will, will not trade any lower. Uh, and that's on the S&P futures, uh, meaning they just stop trading. You can buy it at a higher price, but you're not able to sell it at a lower price until the open of the cash market the following day. And we were at that for a while in 2016. So it wouldn't surprise me if we had something like that, because yes, 2016 was definitely a surprise to the market. But this year, uh, it, it seems to me that no matter what happens, it's going to be a surprise, whether it's a tight Biden win, tight Trump win, landslide by either side, or a contested election, or just we don't know the results yet. It's going to be a surprise no matter what, because there's no normalcy that's going on here. You can't really say that Biden has it locked because of the fact that the polls are doing well uh, for him, uh, because that's the same way it was for Clinton four years ago. So I think right now this could be... Um, the thing I'm not seeing happening tomorrow morning is that we maybe are going to be the same. We're, I, I don't see us opening at the same price we closed at today, whether to the upside or the downside, I can't tell you. <laughs> but I don't see a uh, an unchanged overnight futures market. Interesting. Well, if the past is prologue, it'll, they'll have to wait until uh, Mr. Rhodes joins me. And the second he comes on, we're going to see uh, some big announcement. The futures are going to sell off like crazy. Volatility is going to explode. And that'll be a, a replay there uh, of 2016. But I'm curious. We have a poll going on right now. I want to get each of your thoughts on this as well. I'm kind of getting the pulse of everybody who comes on tonight. Uh, do you think by the end of the evening we will have – a we will know the victor in one way or the other. Uncle Mac, we'll start with you, sir. Yep, I do. I think it's going to be a landslide on one side, and I'm not going to say who, but I do think it's going to. we are going to have a victor uh, by midnight central time. Interesting, interesting. So by the time I lose my voice, we'll know who, who the victor is. Eric, same question for you, sir. Do you think we'll know the results here anytime tonight, or do you think this is going to be one that drags on for a while? I, uh, I appreciate the qualification statement in that it's midnight central. If it's midnight central, I will uh, define a winner. Uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll err on the side of uh, you know nonpartisan and, and not opine as to whom. But um, yes, midnight central, I, I think it's clear. Wow. You know, our audience, I don't think I've ever seen them as split on an issue as they are. This has been locked pretty much down the middle since we posted it. Uh, oh, a couple of hours ago now. It just ticked again, and they both are exactly tied again. Our audience, we asked you, of course, do you think we'll have a clear victor in election 2020 tonight? Uh, yes, definitely. No, it will take days, or I don't know. And uh, right now, yes, definitely, and no, it will take days. They're both tied. 46.1% each exactly. So our audience split down the middle just, uh, I, I can't blame you. I can't blame you. I mean, I know Matt was pretty certain in his prognostication early and a surprising one. But outside of that, it doesn't seem like a lot of people are, are super convinced in one way or the other. About 7.9%, almost 8 saying that they think it will. Uh, Dan, what are your thoughts here on our poll and uh, the way everyone's leaning one way or the other in terms of what there would be a victor, sir? You know, as far as a victor, what is required for someone to to be the victor is to have a concession speech by the other candidate. 
And so in, in, two, in, in the last election, 2016, I actually got back from, from China that morning. And, you know, my sleep schedule was all messed up. I couldn't sleep. And so I ended up staying up all night just watching, you know, watching the news channels, uh, watching the election. And, and that election we thought was close. And that didn't really end until probably about three o'clock in the morning, as I recall. Um, I will bet anyone who is on the show right now five hundred dollars that we don't have a victor. We don't have a concession speech by midnight central time tonight. Interesting. So not a concession speech. So not an official. We may be declaring a victor, but there may be no concession speech. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I like that caveat. on. I'm a little happier with that caveat you put on there, <laughs> out there. But yeah, you never know the networks. They could be calling. What was that like, getting off the plane from China right in the middle of uh, and pretty much the heart of the democratic process? Sir? That contrast must have been pretty stark. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was interesting, you know, fielding a lot of uh, uncomfortable questions uh, with my colleagues uh, when I was there. And then... Getting back to see a very, very different uh, reality was uh, – it was interesting to say the least. That's for sure. Did you get off the plane and just kiss the ground <laughs> and say, I, I cherish my voting? <laughs> I, I, I was happy to vote. I did vote that day and uh, yeah, it's, it, it's an important process. Um, it's too late to tell people to go vote but um, yeah, hope, I hope you did. Well, you can still vote in our poll, so make sure you do just that. We've got uh, K Miller five hundred one chiming in, in the chat saying, "I'm going to change my votes. So I don't know because I don't know after all this talk." <laughs> he says, "But it's such a touchy subject, so strange. We are very strongly split." Yes, uh, you know that's our country right now. We are very strongly split. You're right. It is odd that it is exactly to the tenth of a decimal point uh, even on both sides. That is that is kind of strange, but still, nonetheless, that's. What we find on these strange nights, speaking of strange, a little bit more downside on the S&P futures. I had about a 33.35, actually taking down to 33.34 now. So about 50 handles below where they were not too long ago here on, uh, on the special. So maybe the market's pricing in some uncertainty or maybe some certainty and they don't like the outcome. Either way, <laughs> not looking good for the bulls out there. Certainly not the massive uh, sell-off and annihilation we saw back in 2016. But hey, the night is still young. Speaking of the night being young, let's see how they're updating some of the vote counts. They're saying right now some of the crucial states everyone's watching, Ohio, of course, Florida, uh, Pennsylvania, those are still too early to call out here. But right now, it depends. Now, it's funny, CNN saying Virginia too close to call. AP is calling it for Biden. They're putting Biden now at 131 electoral votes. That puts him at for Vermont, Virginia, Massachusetts, again, according to the AP, others not calling Virginia for him. Uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Illinois, Rhode Island, New Mexico, New York, Washington, D.C., and Colorado. Washington, D.C., with their whopping three electoral votes. Trump, as of this tally at least, has 92. That puts him at Kentucky, West Virginia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Indiana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Louisiana. Not a heck of a lot of surprises, but maybe a few out there. I don't know, Eric, any of these states out there uh, come as a surprise to you or maybe a surprise that some folks out there and some outlets are being as circumspect as they are and not calling things perhaps as early as they used to? I'll tell you the thing that's just most amazing to me is, is Texas. I mean, you didn't mention it in the ones that you know have already been decided, but I just recall for as long as I can even fathom that in Texas was always a, a hardcore Republican state, and and seeing that one potentially get flipped, you know, I think is uh, you know a, a testament to the other side of the fence on, on, you know, historically speaking, as to where Texas sits. But I think could be a litmus test here for for you know the greater landscape here. So that's the one that you know from my lens I think is indicative of of the outcome uh, and and drawing keen attention to that. You know, especially non-Austin, non-Dallas metropolitan uh, to see the results in Texas. 
Yeah, you know, we talked about that earlier in the show. You're right. I mean, Texas has been a reliable red stalwart for, you're right, as long as I can remember. In fact, we were just talking about it at the very beginning of the special. We had to go dig up a trivia fact, and I believe it was the, the director of Risk over there at Swan who said it was not, since 1976. you got to go that far back for the last time that Texas swung Democratic. And coming into today, it was very much in play the uh, the uh, you know it was they were calling it as opposed to red more of a pink they the polls were mostly within one percent of each other which is very much within the margin of error a lot of that of course caused by the changing demographics of texas we have immigration from the south and immigration from the rest of the u.s too we're hearing a lot of stories of people moving from let's say the northeast and the west and moving to southern states that are warmer maybe a little bit less restrictive during times like this so that's changing the demographics down there as well. The meatball, he'll be on in a little bit. He's now an Austonian. He used to be out here in the suburbs. So maybe a lot of that may be helping to change the demographics of Texas as well. And you're right, they have not called that one as well. Mr. Dan, sounds like you were hoping to have a little bit of action. Any takers here in the back room chat here while I was talking, sir? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm I'm chatting with Mike a little bit over here, and I think we might have a little bit of a little bit of action, Mortimer, on this. Uh, <laughs> and the loser has to admit it on their show, which is you know like bragging rights. I mean, hey, man. The, I mean, to me, that's worth more than money. So, all right, done, Mike. We we've got a bet, baby. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's on. I'll send. I'll send you a dollar in the mail. You send me a dollar in the mail. Uh, winner take all, baby. And then the loser has to admit on their show, Mr. Longo, can you hold us to that on our respective shows? I will be happy to hold you to it. And by my count, you're still open on $499, Dan. So Luke or Eric, any takers on Dan's uh, $500 election bonanza? Going once, going twice. <laughs> well, I'm on the same side as him. I don't think, I mean, they're not going to count the Michigan votes for another 36 hours in <laughs> unless you can, unless you, unless you can flip Texas and Florida to say the rest of those states don't count, I, I just don't see. Plus, as I said, there's already two uh, lawsuits: one in Nevada by President Trump about um, counting votes, mail-in votes, and one somewhere else. I just don't, I don't see it by by midnight central. And maybe you want to add on. Maybe you want to bump up Dan to like a thousand and see what ta- what takers you got out there. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Any listeners, you want some of this action, just let us know in the chat. We'll get your PayPal sorted out and everything uh, behind the scenes here. Maybe you can t- you take crypto I, I, as well, I, I, Dan? I maxed out my election wager budget, otherwise I'd bet more. <laughs> Dan, you, t- you take crypto, maybe a little Bitcoin can sneak in there as well? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, in increments of one Bitcoin. Oh, that's a, that's a lot. I think Bitcoin ticked over 14,000 tonight. So uh, so we're seeing some interesting. Let's go back and check out on some of these uh, other products outside of the indices. It's a little bit shy of, uh, of 14,000 right now, 13,775, but still feeling a robust move up about two and a quarter percent on the day. So all this talk about, you know, these things are uncorrelated. Well, right now, kind of holding to that. But we have said before, when it all hits the fan all these products tend to move in lockstep. Everyone's dumping things across the board. You know, Eric, you guys obviously see this probably a lot right now. It's probably an interesting, maybe a frustrating thing you guys have to deal with. People come to you, maybe they have a portfolio they think is sufficiently diversified. They have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Maybe they got some equities, some fixed income, some maybe a little bit of gold if they're really daring out there. And then they think they're fully diversified. And then an event comes like March or what we saw a week or two ago, or maybe, who knows, the night is still young, maybe even tonight, and we see all of these assets moving in lockstep. A, how exciting and or frustrating is that for you? And then B, maybe the reason I say it's exciting, because maybe that's a good counterpoint for you to come to them and say, hey, by the way, you know, these, these option things could, could maybe handle that for you, Eric. You couldn't be more correct, Mark. I, I, I can't tell you how many instances people come with a diversified portfolio and it ends up being all the same thing, which is S&P. Um, you know, at the end of the day, though, you, you look at how asset allocation and portfolio construction is, is devised historically, it's, it's challenged today. So you can't actually fault them for having things that all, you know, rhyme collectively because the fixed income landscape is, you know, it's dismal, right? I mean, the, the defense mechanism that fixed income historically provides and sell offs, it's, it's, somewhat mathematically impossible for that to continue going forward. And if you're going to have that as a placeholder, 
just for you know volatility dampening, that's where the options start to take a real you know focal point in the conversation, which is we can get you that same volatility dampening with equities, you know, using different instruments, whether you whether or not we use the jargon of, of a put or a call option and, and the merits therein, the the effect is the same, right? And so, you know, you look at all of the the I would say portfolio construction, you know, modifications that have happened in the last really 10, 15, you know, 20 years in the advent of ETFs. And the correlation has gone up. It's definitely gone up. It's hard to get diversification away from, you know, the equity asset class. But frankly, that's what monetary policy has forced people to do. So you can't fault anybody in their portfolio construction. The goal is to then just kind of steer them and, and really solve for the objective that they're trying to solve for. And, you know, two portfolios identically built have potentially different objectives. So understand the objectives and then solve for those. And, uh, you know, that's all you can control. Luke, I'm sure you probably have some thoughts on this as well. This is what you guys do over there at Equity Armor. How challenging is it for someone uh, to come to you and think they're diversified in those moments like March or a couple of weeks ago? Or like Eric was saying, do you see that maybe more like an opportunity to say, hey, you know, we can do some interesting things with options and or volatility that you can't do just buying 35 different underlyings that at the end of the day are all correlated to the S&P? Yeah, it's, it's a, little bit of a, bo- a little bit of both for us. Um, as Eric said, and as, as everyone knows, I mean, I think 40% of the NASDAQ is the S&P. And when you uh, break it down and look at the components of these, of these indices, Microsoft, Apple, Google, you might have six, seven, eight funds, but really what you have is one fund. And then when the market goes down, you think you've diversified, yeah, it turns out you weren't diversified at all. And the way we do it, you know, as I did some stuff with the partners in the NASDAQ earlier in the year, we, we were going with a barbell strategy in January. And we said, you need to have these two buckets as your barbells. One side, dividend paying stocks, S&P stocks. This side, uh, NASDAQ tech stocks and some growth. And for a while, leave the middle alone. You're not going to get anything out of the middle. And you should own those things with some volatility or, or, or a hedge and try to stay in the market because it's getting harder and harder to stay in the market when all the assets move in the same direction, right? So you thought you were diversified. The market goes down. All your mutual funds or ETFs have gone down. It makes you want to sell out of the market, and you're selling out at the low, and we all know the math behind that, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, it is a uh, it has gotten harder for investors to try to to try to find some uh, new ground to try to be diversified. But the market is what it is, and I, this is the way we're doing it right now. We're doing it with a barbell strategy. You have to own some vol, and that's how we're moving forward for 2021. Speaking of moving forward or perhaps upward, that's exactly what's been going on out here. S&P Futures feeling the rally at about 33.75 right now. That puts them, oh, about 40 handles higher than they just were the last time we checked them. And then about almost 10 handles below where they kind of maxed out during the show, right around that 33.85 level. Right when Dan started talking, Dan Grams, of course, about that 3,400 level maybe being a bit of a ceiling and then all of a sudden it turned right, right back around, dropped down to like 33, 35 or so. Now rallying big. I'm not sure. I'm trying to look to see if they called any more states. I don't think any changes have been uh, been made. Uh, we got the Rock Lobster chiming in saying he thinks the betting line out there, I guess maybe in Vegas, I was looking at, has flipped to Trump for now. <laughs> uh, that would certainly seem to be correlating with what we're seeing out there in the futures. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyone uh, seeing any reason for why we're rallying so hard out there right now? It uh, looks like it's maybe even pulling back just a little bit now. It's, uh, it, it, it's a crazy night with these futures, man. Yeah, there's no liquidity either, right? You put a one lot out there, you, you're moving it. But um, yeah, I think Trump is doing – Trump is starting to do better than people thought. Um, looks like he's going to win. They're predicting he's going to win Texas. They just said Bloomberg. Oh, that could be it then. I might be on a delayed feed, guys, but the the Nasdaq seems to be drastically outperforming the spoos in the futures market. And you know, if that's the case, you know, I think that's at least uh, 
from the research that I've been fed from about three or four different venues, um, you know, that, that's, that's indicating Trump uh, and just kind of DOJ antitrust speculation around big tech yeah. and Biden and, and his, his task force. Yeah, our, our rule for tonight is NASDAQ goes up, it looks like Trump is going to do better. And if S&P goes up, it looks like that's value and that's, that's more Biden. That's, that's how we're looking at it. Yeah, I'm, I'm echoing that sentiment. Well, it seems like the markets are echoing that as well, giving back a little bit of that lift right now, but they're certainly pricing in a little bit more upside or perhaps a lot more upside than they were a little while ago. Mr. Luke, sounds like uh, you got some other other bones to pick this time out there uh, with all things Fed. What, the Fed not, not getting it done for you these days, sir? The Fed hasn't gotten it done for me for 10 years. And this is nothing political or who's president or who's not, but I just don't understand Going back to Janet Yellen, who to me is the worst Fed president of all time, and Powell is get, starting to get close. When the market is going up, why are you constantly talking about raising rates and saying, if we hit these bogeys, we're going to raise rates, we're going to do this, we're going to do that? I think Janet Yellen must have raised rates twice while she was in. One of them was for like 0.15 basis points or something. And this is this is – you're you're selling the middle class and retirees down the river when you're giving them zero return on their savings and pushing them into risk assets. And then what happens when we have an event in March and a lot of the large, ultra large hedge funds are levered to the basis trade or whatever, the Fed comes in and bails them out by giving huge liquidity to the market instead of letting some of these funds go under, instead of letting people who take too much risk lose money, go broke, so other people who are disciplined can come in and pick up pick up these assets at, uh, at a discount or uh, pick them up at a lower price. Mm. And it's just been – this game has been going on for 10 years. It's nonstop. I mean, why – if the market is so great, if everything's going so great before the pandemic – why didn't you raise rates? Why why weren't rates raised? And no one ever asked that. And another thing, if everybody thinks inflation is so low and it's non-existent, I'll do another trade. Uh, I'll pay someone 4% or 5%, and I want to pay the same amount I was for babysitting, college, school, dental work, prescriptions, uh, rent, although I don't rent, whatever you want. I'll pay you 5%. If inflation's at zero, then anybody should be able to, would be willing to take that trade, and I guarantee you no one, no one will. Not, not if you have kids in college, you sure wouldn't take that trade. <laughs> no, I feel for you there, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dan. You've got the big costs here. <laughs> yeah, but I, I guess I'm saying inflation's not at zero. Don't believe it. And by the way, this is no exaggeration. In the last 25 years, they've changed the way they calculated inflation like 20 times. And how funny is it that FOMC is meeting, what, tomorrow? <laughs> is there a more ridiculous time for a, a Fed meeting than the day after? The, uh, the initial blush of the election will still not even be done. And, of course, the Fed has already announced pretty much what their road plan is uh, for the foreseeable future. And yet uh, they're still insisting <laughs> on, uh, on having a meeting on, on the uh, – this seems like an odd day to be having – a meeting. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.